I'm going to list off five or six guys, um, coaches and or players, names that everybody would know uh, in Sooner Nation. And I just want you to give me either one word or one quick thought, like first thing that comes to mind when I when I talk about these guys, when I mention their name. All right, Joe Mixon. Freak athlete, most talented player I ever played with. Trey Millard. Dog. <laughs> Baker Mayfield. Gussy competitor, best best on field leader I've ever I've ever been around. Kyler Murray. Sooner faithful, welcome to episode two of the Dial It Up Pod. I'm your host Trevor Knight. Last week we had an incredible guest in Dimitri Flowers, the Swiss Army knife. This week, we got another guest, a big boy up front, Ty Darlington, my roommate for four years, Campbell Award winner, Werfel Trophy winner, first team all Big 12 center, and a member of the college football playoff team in 2015. Uh, like always, we'll be dropping these once a week. We're gonna have guests on. We're gonna talk about the past, the present, the future of OU football, have on some lettermen, have on some people in academics and athletic departments, and um, you'll get all your content right here on the Dial It Up pod. Check us out on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your pods. Follow us on social media for highlights of the show. You can follow my personal page, Trevor underscore Knight Nine, or Red Dirt Media at Red Dirt Media. And uh, you'll be able to see some great clips and listen wherever you listen to your pods. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And we really appreciate all your support. Enjoy the show. College football tees, college basketball tees, whatever you need, Mercury has you covered with the best merch out there. We're talking about high quality clothing, inexpensive, and the best part is I have a 15% discount for everybody who goes and gets some right now. Use the code below, hit the link in the description, and go get your merch now. Use the code to get 15% off. What are you waiting on? Go do it. Fans, I am excited to announce episode two guest, the one, the only Ty Darlington, straight out of Apopka, Florida. Ty, how are we doing today, man? Doing fantastic. Glad to be on with you here, uh, Trevor. Yeah, absolutely, man. Let me give you a, a couple highlights real quick on Ty Darlington. Uh, Ty was my roommate all four years at Oklahoma, and uh, we've got a ton of stories, and we'll get into some of that later. But um, the guy did have an incredible career um, in the Crimson and Cream Campbell Award winner, Campbell Trophy. That is the academic Heisman, so to speak. So he was a pretty good student in the classroom as well as on the field. He also won the Werfel Trophy. We both won that award. Uh, that's this little trophy right up here you can see part of behind me. Um, that's the academic and uh, uh, community service award, if you will. And we got to do a lot of fun things together and we'll share some of those stories. Also was first team all Big 12 center in 2015, was a center on a college football playoff team that played in, the, played in the Orange Bowl and just made a huge impact both on and off the field in his time in Norman. So Ty, let's, let's dive in, man. Give us first a quick update. Um, you're in the coaching world now. Uh, once you got done playing at OU, you tried to go play in the NFL. That quickly came to a halt, as it does for most people. And then you dove right in uh, back there in Norman. You've since moved on from them. But give us give us a quick update on your career uh, progression and also what's going on in your personal life. Yeah, so uh, some people may know I, I, I coached at OU for five years, uh, starting in the 2017 season. And I actually was, I got, it was really cool because I got to start working with quarterbacks, which I played offensive line my entire life. So I didn't know anything at all. And I was paired up with, um, I was the, like the GA when Baker was playing and he just bullied me and tried to, and just tried to throw balls at me and Indy as hard as he possibly could. Um, I wasn't offering much uh, insight into coaching him, but I'm still going to claim his Heisman. Um, but I, but I spent those five years, uh, working with those guys and, uh, being with coach Riley and absolutely vastly expanded my understanding of football, um, and the other side, another part of the game. And last of those years being 2021, 
which obviously everyone knows kind of where, where you were and, and what you were doing when, 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 uh, Lincoln decided to go to USC and all that followed that. And with my, uh, my family, with me being from Florida, um, and having been with Coach Riley for a long time, I thought that it was, it was best to go and get to learn something new, um, and get to get back closer to home. So I went to the University of Florida for a year, uh, with phenomenal people with Coach Napier and his staff there, learned a lot different way of doing things, different operating system, different offense, uh, but learned a lot in that year. Um, and then one of our, actually, in, back in what it would have been 2016, Trevor, when you transferred to a and I met a guy named Connor McQueen, a little, uh, little fiery little redhead that liked to hold cold kicks and uh, became friends with Connor. Um, and then Connor, me and Connor got into coaching about the same time. And um, then he was, at, he was with us at OU and me and him were really close uh, working together. He went to USC, I went to Florida, but then uh, about this time last year, he became the offensive coordinator at Incarnate Word. And, uh, for some people that may not know what, what is an Incarnate Word? Um, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, a small, uh, private Catholic school in San Antonio, Texas, plays at the FCS level. It's been very successful the last, especially the last five years when three out of five conference, conference titles, um, were, uh, 13 and two, two years ago, nine and two this past year and have been in the top five in a lot of offensive categories for the last couple of years. So me and, uh, me and Connor are getting to kind of do that together, uh, together here. Uh, now coach was coaching the tight ends last year, now coaching the offensive line, kind of a little bit back home for me. I've kind of gone all the way around, so starting with the being with the quarterback for so many years, then tight ends, then now kind of back to what I know and love, uh, with the O line guys. So we're getting ready for, you know, another season, but a lot of some, some new faces in our, on our roster and trying to go, trying to go win a national championship, trying to win a South of Conference title and all those things, but enjoying every single day, uh, with my guys and with these coaches on staff they're really good dudes love it yeah a lot of great things going and and for you listeners out there ties on the fast track to uh to being a huge name in in the college football world um obviously rising through the ranks as a position coach now and running the offensive line but hopefully one day we see him back in the crimson and cream uh calling the shots who knows right um let's take a step back kind of to your early years grew up in apopka florida dad was a high school head coach you're the oldest of seven kids. Uh, a lot of pressure on, on you growing up. Tell us some of the stories and, and some of your fondest memories of being the oldest of seven and especially having a dad as a coach growing up. Oh man, uh, you've heard you've heard all of them. But uh, my mom was a was a was a big Sooner fan. She was a she was on the on the Palm Squad, not the cheerleading team. Palm Squad uh, in the eighties and the and I was the when I graduated from OU, I was the sixteenth graduate in the last three generations. So I was brainwashed, Sooner born, Sooner bred. Um, I, I learned Boomer Sooner in Texas sucks in, in the first five years of my life um, and still live by that mantra forever. Uh, but, you know, I grew up with a bunch of kids. Dad was a coach. I grew up around the game. Um, and uh, and definitely, you know, my I my dad was hard on me, but it was it was what I wanted to. Like, I look back now, I think I was crazy because um, I would be doing I'd be doing pass sets on trees in the front yard. And I, I fully participated in all. I never missed a summer workout from fifth grade on. Um, with, with my dad's high school team, I get trampled by the older guys, but, uh, you know, there's some bumps and bruises in my back and hips feel the way they do, uh, probably because of my early training age. But at the same time, it got me, I got a chance to chase my dream. I great dreamed of being an Oklahoma football player my entire life. Uh, and the, the work habits and the things I, I, I learned, uh, with my dad, uh, as a, as a young kid, they set me up for success in the long term. And I know that I don't take it for granted that not many people get a chance to go, go chase those dreams and fulfill those dreams. And yeah, I didn't have a significant career in the NFL by any means, but uh, honestly, I, I dream of being an OE football player more than I dream of being an NFL football player. And so I, I'm very grateful for that time. No doubt. Yeah, pretty cool. And your family is amazing. And the fact that you had uh, the mentality as a young kid to go and do pass sets on a tree in the front yard, as opposed to saying that you were a quarterback, is uh, it, it, pretty cool. Because that was my, my, my dad made that decision for me, though. I used to wear number 44. Uh, I thought I was going to be a fullback. Like, like, and like Mike Allstott was my hero. Um, and then I turned 10. I turned 10 and my dad, my dad told me I needed to pick an offensive line number because that was where I was going to be. That was where I was headed. Hey, dad was steering you in the right direction and it, it obviously worked out for you. So you get recruited by Oklahoma, obviously lifelong dream of yours. I was getting recruited at the same time and I'll never forget. We were on our official visit together and standing in the back of good old 747 
And uh, we were, we were fish out of water, man. I, I remember just being like, oh my gosh, college is crazy. Like, look at these girls, look at these dudes, look at the way these people are acting a fool. And I kind of looked over to my left and you had the same look on your face. And I was like, what's up, dude? What are you doing here? He's like, I'm on my official visit. I'm like, yeah, well, so am I. You want to go over to Fuzzy's and grab some tacos? And, uh, and the rest is history. So we got to become roommates. And um, honestly, one of the privileges of my life, I know we talk about this all the time, all the ups and the downs that we got to go through together. But I do have to share this story. And I want you to rebuttal, okay? Um, Ty was great guy coming in, a little undersized, but was ready to work. Um, we, we hit it off pretty quickly. But one thing that I just couldn't stand about you was, um, it was a fashion statement, I guess. But if you guys remember the Nike Elite socks that had different color stripes on the back of those socks, you know, that, that go up to your calves, uh, Nike slides and then Jordan shorts that were down to your shins. Well, Ty would mix and match those every single day to where they were color coordinating also color coordinated shirt and then you would wear the most ridiculous hats in the world i mean the fact that you ever had a, a female look your way and the fact that you're married today i think is insane given what you look like back in 2012 so it's also obviously because of because of the guidance that i got from you you know i evolved some a little <laughs> bit uh, i look I'll back you know, i'll take all the credit I, I mean, I, I've, I've mellowed out a little bit. I'm more all American clean cut, but you know, it, guys, it's um, come completely full circle. I went from, you know, the, just this ridiculous fashion to now he points and, and, and turns it on me saying that I'm just too run in the mill, too careful, all those things. I don't yeah. test the status quo. So, I mean, that was funny. Let's, um, let's dive into the playing career. We had a lot of fun times together. Obviously got to battle to be uh, uh, on the field as young guys. Um, it didn't always go our way, but I'd say we both tasted success pretty early. Talk a little bit about um, you know the progression that you had to go through to gain weight, to be ready to play, um, and then you know the, the ups and downs that you went through in your career um, that, that allowed you to, yes, see success at the end, but it always wasn't an easy road, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's one thing that I feel like um, has been really valuable as a coach is that I got, I've kind of tasted a little bit of everything as far as I know what it's like to be called upon early. And I also know what it's like to sit the bench and have to be a good teammate um, and have to earn the respect of your teammates over time. And I think that's something that, especially nowadays with transfer portal and that type of stuff um, that, that not everyone wants to do that. I um, mean, you know, early on, um, my freshman year, because if for OU fans, I remember Ben Haber was a phenomenal player, great dude too, uh, that Ben had medically retired in the summer going into our freshman year. So all of a sudden I went from a developmental, he's going to red shirt and then he'll be, he'll be called upon later on to all of a sudden I got to be ready to play now with the twos. Um, and then towards the back half of that year with, uh, fellow podcast host, uh, Gabe Eichard, um, when Gabe, when Gabe went down with a concussion, immediately preceding a Katy Perry concert. Um, then I was called on that, that next week to make my first start. And I remember Hypo and Hype and uh, Patton freaking out that like wanting me to like renovate the whole playbook. Like, do you not know how to do this? Does this make you uncomfortable? Having like full out meetings, like guys, I'm okay. The, uh, the mental side was never a struggle for me. I can handle that. Um, you know, Having short arms and being a little lighter, uh, that that's that's more where I struggle. Oh, the old I got bull to, rush, the bull rush, yeah, the bull rush too. But uh, but you know, I I got I played and played well. Uh, then uh, you know, I was obviously I was the player of the game uh, as a, as I like to remind people. Even though I had uh, Landry absolutely ripped me for uh, I missed the snap count. I was, I'd never played in front of eighty five thousand people before. And, uh, and I missed a snap count and tempo call in a loud situation, got a false start penalty. Um, but, uh, you know, I had some success early. And then, you know, that that following year um, went from being a being a guy that was playing as a freshman to Coach Beedenbo coming in and me not necessarily liking him a whole lot and me thinking that he didn't like me a whole lot um, early on. And I was thinking about transferring. And I was thinking about I need to I, – this, this guy didn't recruit me and, and I wasn't going to play. Because that entire sophomore year, I didn't play snap. I played. Uh, I played a couple snaps uh, on punt shield, um, and uh, and and that, that was really it. Um, and I think that's a that's been a really good thing for me to have experience with the guys I work with on a daily basis. Is because you know I had to go into my coach's office and talk to him 
like a grown man and have to, and have to, uh, and I gained an understanding of how he saw me and why he was pushing me so hard. It wasn't that he didn't like me. It was that he saw that he saw something in me and he was, he was trying to get it out of me. Um, and you know, from then on, like coach Beatenbo is like a father figure to me. I mean, he's in, in the coaching profession, there's not a better dude and he's a phenomenal football coach. Um, and it took me a little bit of time to understand that. Um, and, and, you know, and, and then it was eventually able to, uh, was able to get on the field as a full-time starter and, I mean, I was threatened to be benched many times, uh, and there were some. There have been some verbal altercations, but uh, but had a good career playing for Coach B, and and gained a lot of perspective. And getting to getting to, I was really glad that I got to end it with a Big Twelve championship uh, with you, with with a lot of the guys we came in with, with Shep, with Daron Neal, Neela, uh, some of the guys I was really really close with. We had gone through that eight and five season that really sucked. And it and it took a lot out of you, um, and to finish it in the right way. And I take a lot of pride in that we were the first of six straight, um, and that that started with with our with with, with my senior year, your redshirt junior year. That was the, that was the group that set things straight, um, and got and kind of got Oklahoma after that really really bad year back to where we where we where we belong at the top of the conference. Um, and so uh, that was kind of the the wrap on my playing career, I guess. Yeah, no doubt. And it was the start of a great run for Oklahoma football. Uh, rattling off multiple Big 12 championships there in a row, and a ton of great players, too. A ton of great players, a ton of big-time plays, venues, the whole nine yards. Talk a little bit about the guys that you played with. You just mentioned a couple of them. Leave me out of it, because I know I'm, I'm your favorite teammate of all time, but name one or two guys that you just loved playing ball with, whether they you know, were making every play on Saturday or not, and, and maybe tell us a little bit why they were such great teammates. Yeah, you know, I think that, gosh, it's kind of all over the place. I kind of s- separate it into, you know, times in our careers that uh, that early on, like, I really appreciated, like, Landry, like, that Landry Jones, that he could, he was, he kind of, we're learning from him how to approach things and how to be, especially a man of faith in that, in that arena. Um, Tress Way would be another one that was the FCA president at the time. Just be, how to be, that you can, you can have a lot of success in college and have a great time in college and be really successful on the field and, and still be, an incredibly authentic, generous, uh, faith-centered human being. Um, and those are a couple that I think about uh, early on. You know, uh, Daryl Williams that I that that I played with for several years there. Uh, they, that Daryl just was businesslike, and he wasn't overly vocal, but he worked so hard. Shout out um, Trench Mob Academy, right there. That's right, Trench Mob Academy. I try to send my guys up his way now, and when, when they're guys, my guys that are from Dallas. So, and then he um, he deserves everything that, that he achieved in his you know, his professional career. Um, you know, some other ones. I mean, you know, you know our guy Eric Stryker, uh, Strike, just talking about just an energy guy, just a guy that changes the dynamic of a room the second he walks in. And I will go. Me and me and Strike have come to blows arguing about everything you can possibly imagine from the most absolutely serious you know, national topics to like the most trivial things that you can imagine. Um, then me and Strike, um, we had some really, really special memories with, uh, with him. Um, you know, seeing like Shep, uh, Sterling Shepard with having that the same type of energy and seeing his like evolution and maturity, like even beyond playing, like now he's a dad and he's had a successful career and, and all that type of stuff. Uh, and you obviously, I think you also also got to got to throw a uh, bake in there that uh, you know that bake is a is a dynamic leader and personality. And I got to see kind of a little bit longer than you did. See how he changed from you know pudgy, you know fresh shaven frat frat boy that showed up in Norman from Lubbock to a dude that was the consummate leader in seventeen, and the whole team uh, rallied around him and how he and how he uh, prepared and performed on a daily basis. So those are a couple. I'm definitely probably more offensive biased because those are the guys I spent my time with for the most part, but those are a couple that stand out. Yeah, and I'll just take that what you just mentioned about Bake and run with it for a second. Uh, people ask me about Baker all the time. Um, obviously, we battled it out. He was the reason that I got benched, right? Um, so to the outside world, you think, oh, you probably don't like this guy very much. It's the exact opposite. First and foremost, as you know, Ty, Bake and I are super close, and he is an incredible leader. I remember you know, he gets there, and he's having fun. He's playing softball in the intramural fields. Um, and, and just kind of enjoying a little time as being a college student before he was able to join the team. Uh, but as soon as he did, there was just something different about him. Uh, guys were drawn to him. Um, he wasn't even on the field, and guys just wanted to be around with him. 
be around him. Uh, they, they, they wanted to, you know, go eat lunch with him. They wanted to do all these things uh, just because he got along with so many different types of people. And then I think what solidified it for me is famous video out there. We were at the Russell Athletic Bowl and uh, we're doing an event with the Clemson team and uh, some music starts playing and everybody starts dancing. So one guy goes into the middle at a time and next thing you know, Bake jumps in there and just kills it. I mean, the, the whole place, Clemson players, OU players, everybody else is just going nuts because the guy's a, a pretty good dancer. And um, and I remember thinking, man, that's really cool. Um, this team's going to rally around this guy, right? That's also like how he initially connected with people, which is crazy. Because like those like the first couple months he's on campus, like somehow or another, in whatever venue we were in, he he didn't up start he didn't up dance, and then people found out that about it we'd be putting him up to it and uh, it's just funny that like the most random thing is like that i felt like that broke down some barriers with people and now this like this dude that just transferred in is like one of the boys and immediately you know? yeah and he was one of the boys and we all hung out and 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 you saw it too he was able to have fun and dance around but then as soon as the pads went on and he was in between the lines i can name a couple guys that i've been around that has the focus and the intensity and just the drive that a guy like baker mayfield does um he's a he's a he's a killer i mean when he gets out there he just he wants to win he's so passionate about it. he's got a chip on his shoulder and and that's why he's been successful and yeah i just got to give a shout out to him this year with, with tampa bay and what he's was able to prove to the entire world that you know, he's still Baker. He's an ultimate competitor and, and he's wonderful. Let, let me do this, Todd. We'll switch gears real quick. And, and I will mention Baker as one of these names, but I'm going to I'm going to list off five or six guys, um, coaches and or players names that everybody would know uh, in Sooner Nation. And I just want you to give me either one word or one quick thought, like first thing that comes to mind when I when I talk about these guys, I mentioned their name. All right. Joe Mixon. Freak athlete. Most talented player I ever played with. Trey Millard. Dog. <laughs> Baker Mayfield. Gussy, competitor. Best best on field leader I've ever I've ever been around. Kyler Murray. Maybe the best athlete I've ever seen. Him or Anthony Richardson would be the best athletes I've ever been around. There's a lot of ways you go with Kyler. Yeah. Bob Stoops. I mean, legend. Gain more respect for him. As time goes on, I gain more and more respect for him. Samaj P. Ryan. Workhorse. And the most humble dude that you'll ever meet. We forced him to we forced him to break the record. That's right. pressure. <laughs> Trevor Knight. Mm, I can't say. <laughs> I, I thought it was just going to come out. You're going to say something bad <laughs> <Yeah>. on air. <laughs> Great guy. I you almost got me there. I almost I almost defaulted. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Well, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So let's um last quick question in terms of those guys because it just came to mind. Talk about the 427 game with Samaj P. Ryan. Um, we are obviously playing Kansas. I was hurt that game. Cody Thomas, who's now playing in Japan, uh, playing baseball. Uh, was the starting quarterback that week. We knew it was going to be tough weather, so we wanted to pound the rock, um, but we never really expected, or at least I didn't, nobody really could, that uh, that, that your running back's going to run for 427 yards in one game. So get, just give your thoughts and, and kind of the memory of that day and what it means to you as an offensive lineman. No, oh, obviously it's a great point of pride for, you know, for the group that there was a lot of adversity, you know, and that, that not only, cause I believe Keith Ford was out too. So it was really just Samaj A, you were out, Shep was out. Um, and then also I believe Shed was out. We were, yeah, because we were playing with Deontay Savage and Neela were the two guards, I believe. Um, but uh, I was aware of the record because Melvin Ingram, no, not Melvin Ingram, Melvin Gordon um, had just broken it like the week before. And he had rushed for 408 against Nebraska, and my brother played in Nebraska. So I'd already I had, had a conversation with my brother. So I was just it was in my mind that like that 408 was the number. And then like we, we were coming out at halftime, and it was already 200 ish. And like I just became aware of it, and we were talking about it on the bench in between in between drives. And then like the game was like getting to the point where it was like it was out of reach, and uh, and Samaje like wanted to come out and let other guys play and like we made it really clear on the sideline like this is not for you this is for us and you're gonna stay in the game 
and um, like we, 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 me and uh, Daryl and Neela were just like, you know, should basically bully him, saying you're a freshman. He was a freshman. It was like, hey, you're. We were tracking like by by drive. We we're adding up the adding up the adding up the yards and everything. And um, and we were like, we were locked in. Like we knew exactly how many yards he needed. We went to that that long. We were like, in stretch uh, at the end there where he uh, he broke a long one, and we knew immediately that he had just broken it. And, uh, great great memory uh, with Samaje because of the way he handled it. And he was so humble, and then also with those guys that like that was a. Uh, one of the more frustrating that year was really frustrating, but one of the most frustrating things was that that offensive line was really really good. Um, gave up nine sacks that year, um, and Coach Beatenbow was upset at the end of the year um, in the locker room after the game because he said like he's had some good ones since, but uh, he told us we were the best, we were the best group he'd ever coached. Now that's been that's since been disproven. Sure, seventeen, eighteen. Uh, o lines are probably better, uh, but you know that 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 group uh, didn't get the accolades and didn't get the didn't get to go out the way that the way that they deserve to, especially these older guys. Um, and uh, and that was kind of that was that was nice for them to get for us to get to have that as a group because we didn't have the accolades, the wins that we wanted to. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, four twenty seven in one game, absolutely unbelievable. And I know that's something from a from a pride standpoint that you hold on to, and all all those big boys up front hold on to. That's pretty cool. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the 2024 Sooners. Um, obviously, Brent Venables had a couple years under his belt now. Dylan Gabriel transfers up to Oregon. Um, Jackson Arnold is stepping in as the full-time starter at, at quarterback. Talk a little bit about what you've seen from the outside world. I know you're busy on Saturdays and whatnot, but from a culture standpoint, what BV is doing, but also just your take on, on what this team has the potential to do moving into the SEC and what you expect out of them. Yeah. No, I think obviously it's going to be a huge challenge. Um, the biggest thing when I was leaving OU, knowing that the SEC, um, the move to the SEC was on its way, was is the roster ready? No, I'm not not the starting book group but is the entire roster ready um because that was the thing when we played georgia when we played alabama is they're rolling in platoons of d linemen um and particularly along the in the trenches and the front seven on the defensive side is a huge deal um but that's a couple of things that they've done that that bb's done to to his credit to is to flip that roster and to recruit really really well um so they've recruited really well especially on the defensive side of the ball um the last several years and that, uh, and that's one thing that I think that uh, helps a lot. The other thing that I think helps a lot is a huge chunk of experience returning, especially on the defensive side of the ball, um, to be able to make that adjustment. And BV runs a you know pretty complicated defense, so it's it's really good and really important to have a lot of experience returning. Um, they're going to get tested as far as you know just going 70, 70 plays with with some of the teams that they're going to play. Um, but uh, but they're really well set up, especially on the defensive side and the offensive side. Um, I am actually a huge fan of of the trade uh, without stepping on any toes. Um, I think Dylan Gabriel is a fantastic player, um, but Jackson Arnold's different, um, and especially because my my uh, coaching career was was Baker, Kyler, Jalen, Spencer, Caleb were my five years, um, and Jackson Arnold is 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 that tier of a talent, and. And Dylan Graber is a really good player, but he's not in the same tier of ability and ceiling um, as some of those other guys. And he's, as you saw in the bowl game, you're going to go through your bumps. And he actually, besides the turnovers, like he did a lot of really good things that game. Um, and uh, and some of the turnovers, I would say, were not on him. But uh, but you know that I, I really think that uh, that that's that that's the direction that you want to be going. This is a really good situation with uh, with with Jackson Arnold taking over. And you know, obviously, I'm biased, but I I don't I don't know Seth Luttrell as well. I have a lot of respect for him. I've only heard great things about him. Um, but I know Joe John very well, and I think the world of Joe John. I think that he's going to be a he's going to be a big time. You know he's a coach right now, but he's going to be a big time play caller and eventually a head coach. Like that dude's legit. And he gets it because those guys. What's really cool about OU is that it's it's all the a lot of the guys on staff like play there, and there's a certain level of pride that you take um, when you're playing. Now that I've coached at places that I haven't played, I understand the difference and just like what you feel when you walk into the building and level of responsibility. It's cool that you got Demarco, Joe, John, and Seth uh, that all play there and know what it's like and know what the what carrying that mantle means uh going forward so i i'm really excited for that um there i know that especially the backs flash at towards the end of the season with saw chuck and um 
and and some of those guys. And they have a good recruiting class coming in. I know, obviously, uh, you know, offensive line is going to be a question mark. They pull some good dudes out of the portal, um, and that that are pretty that are pretty well respected. And some guys I've been around with, Mark, Michael Tark went up Florida, um, and think highly of him. And he'll he'll mesh well with Coach B. Um, and uh, and obviously, the, I just have I've trusted in, in, in Coach B that he's going to he's going to put it together. And so you, I think you're going to have a really, really talented quarterback. Uh, uh, you'd like to see a skilled player, particularly a receiver, become a dominant player. That's what they haven't had in the last couple of years, like we did with C.D., Marquise Brown, D.D. Westbrook, Shep, where you have one dude that can just win the one-on-one whenever you need him to. Um, and Marvin's a good player. Marvin's definitely – Marvin's a good player. I shouldn't discount him. But you'd love to see, like, Nick Anderson, like, step up and be that dude. Because the offense is different when you have that guy, um, so the, that's kind of the the forecast, I guess, the way I see it. You know, Jackson Arnold's development and maturity, and how long is going to take him to to start playing at a high level? That's the number one determinant. Um, that and probably the offensive line coming together. No doubt, yeah, a lot to look forward to. Certainly, some question marks, but I think we're all on pins and needles waiting for spring ball, and then of course the fall to see these guys take Owen Field and uh, and start getting after it. You mentioned a couple of things that I want to touch on here real quick before we wrap up. The, relist the, the quarterbacks that you had a chance to coach in your time on staff there at OU because it's a remarkable um, list of guys. And a, a lot of guys, obviously, that won Heisman trophies that are starting in the NFL um, or, or should have won a Heisman trophy and, uh, and, and just played an extremely high level of football. What did List them out, and then what is one or two things that those guys had in common? Because I know I know they're all very different players, very different personalities, but just from a success standpoint, what did those guys have in common? Yeah, um, it's my five years were Baker, then Kyler, Jalen, Spencer Rattler, and Caleb Williams last year. Um, you know, and they're different. That's a fun game to play and start you know, comparing how they're, you know, which one you take and what situation, how they're, how they're the same, how they're different. Uh, you know, I think the, the single thing that unites them all is that just competitive drive is that these guys are just freaking elite competitors. Um, especially, you know, Baker is the out ultimate competitor. Um, you know, and then you look at the ways that guys are, that guys are a little bit different, you know, that Jalen prepared, prepared better than anyone that I've ever seen. Um, and hit the level he did, the preparation he put into his body and to the mental side of the game. Um, you know, I think Caleb is, uh, is, inc- is gifted and incredibly charismatic and his teammates rally around him. Um, he's a good mix of all the qualities, right. Of all the things you want. Um, and, um, uh, and he and he cares a lot. Caleb does. Like the thoughts of like Caleb's not going to play in this game or that game. Like Caleb loves football, um, and he, yeah, he likes fashion and painting his nails and doing some other things too. But he loves football. And he loves his teammates. Um, you know, and I think that uh, Kyler is one that I think people don't see him as much. He's just a different personality. Uh, I think what people don't understand about Kyler is everybody knows he's really fast. He's a freak athlete. Blah blah. That dude is really really smart. Like he is very, very intelligent. Um, and he is probably the most competitive of any of those guys. Like anything that you do, like he is, he's trying to beat you and he means it. Um, and he's, he's a little bit rough around the edges. He might, he might go at, he might go after some people if you, you know, if you're not running the route right or if you miss the blitz pickup. Um, but, uh, but he, he is, he is really intelligent and he is really, really competitive. You know, um, it's been, it's been really cool to see how Spencer has grown since he left OU um, because I think he needed that. Um, they just the arc of his, of his development um, that, that it was, it was, I think it's, he'll tell you later on. I think that down the road, he'll say it was a good thing that he went through that. And then he's able, been able to find success in South Carolina because he's as smooth of a thrower as anybody. He is smooth um, and a really effortless thrower. He's talented. Um, so yeah, as all the guys are, I'd say, but the one, the one united thing is that competitive drive is just, yeah. it has to be, it has to, it has to absolutely keep you awake at night. You can't, you can't, the thought of losing a game is impossible. No doubt. Well, you are certainly around some incredible players and, uh, and, and you can claim a little bit of those Heisman uh, trophies and, and all the success and all the wins you got to, I mean, you were in there, you had, a, you had an effect on it. Uh, last question here, and then we'll wrap up for the day. And Ty, I appreciate your time, man. Um, this has been awesome catching up and hearing some stories. But 
just share if you can pick one. What was your favorite game or your favorite memory when you were uh, when you were playing at OU and, and wearing the crimson and cream? Uh, I'd probably have to go with Tennessee when I was a senior. When I was a senior, um, the and that, they didn't end up being the best team that we ever beat in my in my time or anything like that. But the atmosphere. Uh, the situation that I mean, the place was absolutely bonkers. It was. Uh, I was actually my starting center here in Carnival Word uh, was at that game. He's from he's from Tennessee, um, and so I talked to him about it. That 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 place was going nuts. You couldn't hear anything um, on the first play of the game. We're on clap cadence for the first time where you're you know, on the clap, and I hadn't gotten a clap in a, in a, and I felt like I should have. I looked back to my legs and Baker's back there clapping and I can't and you hear couldn't it. hear it wow we had to start going we had to start hand signaling up front our combos and 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 he was having to yell in one person's ear uh and I remember there was a moment in that game we were down we were down 14 uh where uh, me and Nila Kazatati are out there it's third long we're down 14 and it is not looking good but that place was they played the uh, little John they're down for what remix um, and, uh, me and Neela are right there. I leaned over the Neela. I just scream, I scream, I scream in his ear. I was like, I know, I know this sucks right now, but this is so cool. <laughs> and, uh, and then we came back. Um, I got rolled up too, because of your brother, um, I got, I sprained my MCL in my right ankle and Baker wouldn't let me leave, leave the game and had some choice words for me. And, but we got it, we got it through it. And then, then a couple of incredible plays by Shep, Zach Sanchez at the end of the game. And we're able to pull that one out. We really had no business winning that game. We played so bad, <laughs> but uh, that was the start of something special. As far as like, there's those moments where you, you, you realize that you have it, that it thing, that thing that you can't, that did, that's intangible that teams have, or they don't the ability to gut out a win and against all odds. Uh, that was really, really special. And something that I'll, I'll take with me forever. Amazing. Amazing. Well, Ty, thanks for, again for sharing all the stories. Thanks for being on. Um, as always, guys, thanks for tuning in to the Dial It Up pod. And uh, follow, subscribe, comment, listen wherever you listen to your pods. And we'll be putting out this great content each week. We'll have guests and, um, and we'll share some fun stories of, of Sooner memories, time in the Crimson and Cream. And uh, we'll certainly get into some stuff of, of the, the guys on the team currently and what we have to look forward to. So as always, thanks a lot. Trevor Knight, Ty Darlington. We'll see you soon.